I'm Tara Brabazon, and for the last time, I introduce myself as the Dean of Graduate Research from Flinders University. Welcome to Vlog 300. What matters? A reflection on being a Dean of Graduate Research. Today's instalment, today's vlog, will be personal, but it is a lot more than that. It will be offering a commentary about the nature of international higher education at the moment so that you can be best placed in this future and i know it does feel like the end of the world at the moment catastrophic events are emerging in higher education but we as scholars have some choices to make we can bow to the lies the deceit the narcissism the confusion, the fear, we can sustain this mode of scholarship, the power plays, the rubbish. We can make a decision to be part of that story. Or we can make a different decision. And those choices are made by you for your future. But for the last time, I will offer Tara's 10 tips for what matters, what I've learnt from being a Dean of Graduate Research. And this role has been an absolute privilege for me to assume. I have been and remain incredibly humbled to have accompanied so many remarkable students and supervisors on their journey. It has been a privilege to know you and a privilege to see the research that you've created. But this series finishes pretty appropriately in my backyard. Now you've seen it before because this backyard has been the setting for some of the more challenging moments of our vlog series, particularly through the pandemic. And it's interesting because we finish in our backyard, but the first vlog was recorded in our lounge room in Bathurst and New South Wales before I took this job. And when I say our lounge room, I mean my beloved late husband, Professor Steve Redhead. We talked about this series and in Bathurst and he was always the first audience for every single vlog up to vlog 101, the digital doctorate. And Steve died three days after that vlog was recorded. But he said to me as one of his last statements, that was a great vlog, you need to write that up in the literature. And Steve, I did, so this one's for you. But as Steve and I were pondering our move to Adelaide six years ago, I was gathering up some research and some evidence about higher degree students at Flinders University. And I saw some remarkable trends, some very odd and interesting sociologies. I saw six years ago that the average age of our higher degree students was then in the late 30s. I went, wow, now it's actually 40. So well over 50% of our students were women. And quite importantly, in the last five and a half years, the trans community, the non-binary identifying colleagues have offered me and have offered Flinders University and the Office of Graduate Research profound advice to ensure that our systems are always safe and welcoming and enabling for you and your research. And I thank you for your good counsel. And I should also thank our gay, lesbian and bisexual students who always make sure and again offer me incredibly significant advice to make sure that your pathway through research is both profound and meaningful. Thank you all. But I also saw that one third of our students were part-time. One third of our students lived outside of South Australia. And the oddity was they, they lived outside of South Australia, but they mainly lived in regional areas of Australia. And probably following on from the high proportion of part-time students, most of our students were not on scholarship. Wow. Now, this, I thought at the time, was an incredibly unusual profile. And as my research has continued in international doctoral education, I've discovered that Flinders was actually just a bit ahead. What is our sociology, what is our student cohort, is actually the future 
of doctoral education. Young people from school who enter an undergraduate degree and then honours or a capstone program and then go into a PhD is a very, very, very small number part of our community. And you see, that's the myth of doctoral education. Governments and universities want you to believe the big lie that the PhD programs are filled with young people just from their undergraduate program. And that's not only wrong, but it's actually a dangerous assumption, a dangerous myth, because it means we're not creating proper policy for the proper future of the remarkable colleagues joining us. So once I realised this profile for doctoral students, the question then became, why are we focusing all our attention on analogue support, face-to-face -face support on a campus in Adelaide during office hours, <laughs> when the bulk of our students are not there in Adelaide and the bulk of our students are, of course, with caring responsibilities or working full time. So most of our students during the working day are a long, long way away from an Adelaide based campus. Therefore, I thought, what are we going to do here? So I've used all my work on online learning from the last 20 years or so to realise that probably this weird, interesting, emerging mode of communication, the vlog, <laughs> might provide an answer. And the vlog had some advantages. So our students around the world could see their dean. They could have a little bit of fresh content on an interesting idea or topic each week. And that's great and that's important and it could be delivered so they're on a commute and they could hear the content. They're doing the school run and they could hear the content. They're going for a walk. They're exercising. So this content could fit in and around their lives. And I also wanted, right from the start, the diversity of our students to be seen. So there is an important slice of these vlogs where I am talking with students. And that was done meaningfully and intentionally. I wanted you out there, hi, from all your diversity, I wanted you to know that you are not alone. You are never alone. So this series was created for, for Flinders University students with particular attention to our regional students, our part-time students and our international students. And quickly, very, very quickly, it became a lot bigger than that. I really constructed this vlog series for two people, Heather and Mel. Hi Heather, hi Mel, in Tennant Creek. And if Heather and Mel got something out of this vlog series, that it was worth the time. And I can report that the wonderful Mel is about to finish, she's very close to finishing her doctorate now. We're so proud of you, Mel. And Heather <sighs> completed her thesis last week. She's graduated. Well done, Heather. But instead of Heather and Mel, which of course were always my primary markets, uh, millions of you, <laughs> millions of you have, have watched these vlogs from a small woman in a small university, in a small city, in a small country. <laughs> and I remain completely humbled, completely humbled by that knowledge. But there's something wonderful about us joining together and enacting this wild experiment in educational media. And the goal of that experiment was to breathe social justice into doctoral education. And I also wanted the vlogs to be responsive, so I activated my three Ds, digitisation, deterritorialization, and disintermediation, to build up new communication systems and community building for you all. And I wanted to confuse the categories of just-in-case training and just-in-time training. I wanted to confuse all of that and create interesting content in odd ways. And when I say interesting content, that's because the overwhelming majority, I'm talking about about 95% of these vlogs came via requests from you. You would send me a message, I would go away, read the referee literature, see what's going on in international debates, and then produce a vlog 
to order. So if you think about it, no one else has really been involved except us. You, me, that camera, that tripod, an SD card and these cards. And that little package has sort of followed me around the world from the University of Macau to the University of Manchester, from Paisley in Scotland to the Umfaston sinkhole <laughs> in Mount Gambier. So this series became much more than an exchange in content. We survived a pandemic together. We have created a vlog every single week for the last five and a half years. There has never been a break in this vlog series. And what's happened is during that time, our numbers at Flinders University have increased radically, a 25% growth in this year alone during a pandemic, and our completions have increased in very, very quick time. So our students are finishing their qualification very quickly and going on to incredible jobs or promotions within their already existing jobs. And I'm so incredibly proud of every single one of our students. Now, what we've done here is we've told some deep truths and we've also told some untold stories. And this is a great story. Your story is a successful story. And this vlog series is a great story, which ends today. Your next Dean will create another story, a new story, a brilliant story. And I hope that you will also support and be part of that new story. So we finish in the backyard. <laughs> there was the focus of the vlogs during the darkest times of the pandemic. The first half of these vlogs was recorded, recorded in my workplace, the second half around my home. And if you think about it, that's sort of been the trajectory of the last five and a half years. And of course, when I say our backyard, I talk about the remarkable person, the greatest gift that's ever happened to me in my life, which is meeting and marrying the wonderful Professor Jamie Quentin. He has breathed new life force into me and we're about to undertake our next adventure together. But today, for the last time <laughs> in this vlog series, I talk about Tara's 10 tips of what I've learned from being a Dean of Graduate Research, or put more precisely, what matters. What have I learned from this job? What have we shared? What can I share with you to enable your future? Let's get into the 10 tips. Tara's tip one, know that it is your thesis. Do not revert to complaints, excuses, or platitudes. The students who are the most difficult to help that come into my office, and indeed the students that are the most challenging to help them reach completion, are the scholars that deflect all their fears and all their worries onto other people. Those other people may be their supervisors, their family members, their kids, their parents, or indeed deans like me. The students, conversely, that finish understand their context, understand that the doctorate is difficult and they take a breath and they get on with it. Now, I'm not saying do not ask for help and support. In fact, I'm saying the exact opposite. It takes a village to complete a PhD student. But instead, what I want you to do is simply ask for that support rather than listing the catalogue of complaints that got you there. So know that everybody, every single human, is carrying an incredibly heavy load at the moment. And if you start unpacking your luggage onto others, not only will they crumble, but they won't be able to help you because they can't help themselves. So we've seen this reality through the vlog series. At the start, you saw students blamed their supervisors a lot. That's where we started. Students blamed their supervisors. Then, of course, through the pandemic, casual staff start to lose their jobs, 
contract staff lost their jobs, permanent tenured staff lost their jobs. So your thesis is important. Absolutely it is. It's crucial. But you started to see through this vlog series that tenured academics were losing their professional lives. So complaining that your supervisor has missed a meeting when they've just been restructured out of the organisation is not only pointless, but it's cruel. It is your thesis. So start every single conversation, firstly, by looking at the person in the mirror. Understand yourself before you make demands of others. Two, use the time well. Higher education has changed radically and catastrophically. Ten years ago, if you enrolled with a permanent tenured academic staff member, the chances are that person would start with you and they would supervise you to the conclusion of your thesis. Now, universities are currently profoundly unstable, so you need to finish your thesis as quickly as possible. Yes, if you need to go on an intermission or a break, do so, but you need to go into that intermission or break recognizing that the supervisory team that was with you at the start of that intermission may not be the supervisory team at the conclusion of that intermission so therefore make the first year count make every day every single day a step to your completion it may be half an hour of reading it may be checking your end notes but the university system and indeed your supervisors are not going to be able to wait for you to finish the PhD. Understand this new reality. Go into a PhD recognising this new reality. Work as hard as you can. Give it everything. And if the worst happens and you lose a supervisor by redundancy or restructure or resignation or retirement, at least you know that you gave it your best shot and no one can do more than that. Three, ensure that you engage with your co or associate supervisor. Right, now my father, Kevin Brabazon, 93, hi big Kev, my father, Kevin Brabazon, was a bookie's dog <laughs> for a portion of his career. Now for our international viewers and perhaps some of our national viewers, you might be wondering what a bookie, a bookmaker's dog actually is. Well, let me share that with you. A bookie's dog is the person who carries the bookie's money. So there's no pay wave going on here, team. This is the people that carry a bag of cash, and they carry that cash from a race meeting to the home base of the bookmaker without, shall we say, intervention from third parties. Now, what I learnt from being the daughter of a bookie's dog and indeed the daughter of a man who worked for a professional bookmaker for a large slice of his career, is that you need to read and understand the, the odds of your life. If you're going to back a roughie, <laughs> if you're going to back a smoky, then you need to understand clearly what can be lost as much as what can be won. Now, I've applied this knowledge about the bookie's dog to the rest of my life, really. Because that means we always have to make decisions with our eyes open. We always have to think about what could go wrong. That is a productive scenario to consider. So I am stunned, absolutely stunned. I was stunned at the start of the series. I'm stunned at the end that students do not grasp the importance of the associate or the co-supervisor. All the focus is on the principal supervisor, right? But the chances are that a chunk of your candidature is going to be managed and organised by this associate or co-supervisor because supervisors go on holiday, supervisors go on sabbatical, they face a family tragedy, they may leave the organisation by choice or by force. Therefore, be a good bookies dog. Bet on the favourite bet on your principal supervisor, but also bet on those supervisors that might get you a place in the race, and indeed, might get you home. So spend time 
working with your co or associate supervisors. Keep them in the loop. Keep the communication system operational because that roughy that you added to your supervisory panel at the start may be the one person that is going to get you home. Four, do not romanticize our universities. Oh yeah. Now, students waste a lot of energy expressing rage or anger at what they think universities should be doing for them. Now, this vision of higher education is based on a reality that has never existed. Up until very recently in the history of our universities, the people who attended higher education were white men from the middle and upper classes. Full stop. So we cannot compare this university with the current system that is post the widening participation agenda in the late 1990s. You know, this, that former system was an elite closed system. So white men have dominated our university systems and they've dominated particularly our doctoral programs. Indeed, in the United States, women were only the majority of people in a doctoral program in 2017. And why that's such a surprise is of course women have dominated undergraduate programs for the last 20 years. So this meant that the doctoral program was, is, was the last bastion of male achievement. And that male achievement was based on a heteronormative marriage where the woman would run the rest of the man's life while the bloke developed the research career. If you think about how postdocs have operated until very, very recently, the male scientist would be appointed and the partner and perhaps children would simply come along for that journey. And no care was dealt to the family. It was about the male postdoc and his development. So to this day, the complete lack of spousal policies in most nations universities show that the whole system is geared to a, appoint a man and know that that man will be supported by a spouse who will run the rest of their lives. So seriously, don't romanticize these old days of higher education. The overwhelming majority of our populations were excluded from universities for the bulk of their history. And if you think about it, therefore, the bulk of the population paid their taxes that allowed the elite to go to universities and sustain and increase their personal power. So the idea that our universities currently are being attacked, demeaned, marginalised and underfunded at the very point in history where Indigenous and First Nation colleagues are attending, the working class are attending, migrants and their children are attending, sexually diverse communities are attending, diverse ages are attending, and yes, women are enrolling, really tells you all that you need to know. At the point that actually the bulk of the population can go to university, that's the point that higher education is underfunded. Yeah. So remember that universities have never been fit for a democratic purpose. Universities are not democratic organisations. They were and they are designed to increase the power of the powerful. So as you move through these systems and structures, always remember this. You are going to have to translate, modify, restructure, create workarounds to make this system work for you. Five. Remember the privilege of research. Now, during this vlog series, I've told a lot of the darker truths of dark academia. But I've also talked about money. I've talked about coin a lot. And I've talked about getting a job and how we actually build a life in and around our universities. But one of the most common words I've used in this vlog series has been the word privilege because we live in a culture of complaint, when in doubt, complain, thesis, hatement, quit lit, and all those really nasty blogs that attack doctoral education. Now, it does not have to be this way if we come to doctoral education recognising the privilege of this enrolment. Remember, only 1% of the 
world's population has a PhD. How many people in their entire life ever have a chance to focus on themselves and personal and professional development for three years? How many people ever in their lives have an opportunity to develop knowledge? Wow. You see, most of our lives are about sacrificing our lives for other people. To earn a living, care for other people, rarely are we ever able to focus on ourselves. Life is just not like that. But a PhD is that moment. It is yours. It is your degree. So few humans walking planet Earth have a chance to enrol in a PhD. So ignore those agro crew that have done a PhD and then start to draw up that drawbridge to stop you from enrolling, trying to make you feel worried about this enrollment. Value the great gift that you have been given. Six, motivation is not enough unless it changes your behavior. Motivation is an incredibly important part of any educational experience, and that includes a PhD. You have to know why you are doing it. You have to know what's the point of this. What's the point of this sacrifice? But students can be motivated and yet still stuck in their degree because it doesn't result in changes in their behaviour. So let me explain. I see so many students that are motivated. They are in fact desperate to complete their thesis. But when I ask them, what are they prepared to change to enable success? I rarely get an answer because their actions show that they are prepared to change nothing. So importantly, log down, write down your motivations, incredibly important. But then what I need you to do is make those connections to behavioral change. How are you linking what you want with what you are doing. Put another way, what are you prepared to give up to be a successful researcher? A PhD cannot be poured into an already full life. I've always described time as a bucket, classy. And if the bucket is full, then a PhD can't be poured into it. So if you want to complete a PhD, then your life must be changed around it. Not everything can change, not everything should change. But the PhD requires space in your life, and indeed, time. Seven, recognize the profound selfishness of academic publishing. Now, most complaints that I receive from PhD students from around the world involve publishing and authorship. There's publishing and authorship, and then a gap, and then a gap, and then a gap to the next tier of complaints. So this is the big one. And there is no doubt that publishing is a, the key problem for higher degree students. But can I say, publishing is not just an issue for our students. It is an issue for all researchers. We are currently living in a crazy system, a crazy system that is made worse by Scopus and Google Scholar. Let me tell you about this. So I was in a meeting only a few months ago uh, where an academic, a professor, no less, tried to explain to a committee that a multi-authored article, so an article with five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten authors, should be granted an equal value to a singly authored book. So an article, six, seven authors, six, seven thousand words in length, should be valued the same as a 70,000 word book written by one person. Now this is nonsense. This is absolute rubbish. But consider how this nonsense is being perpetuated through our academic system. Because just look at Google Scholar, let's start there. I like Google Scholar, but let's look at Google Scholar. Find an article with four authors, or six, or eight, or nine, or 22. And every citation that article receives goes into the profile of each of those authors, whether they are the first author, 
the last author or the inverted commas freeloading postdoc as author four in the middle. Now, then look at a book. There is a book with one author and they get one citation through their profile. So think about it. Eight authors, each of them get that citation. One author, you get the citation. Are they actually of equal value? Really? Come on. And then we have this crazy situation where wherever an author is on the authorship list, the researchers granted the same citation. So whether they're the first author, whether they're the last author, and indeed the freeloading postdoc in the middle. And can I say, I'm aware that's a dreadfully pejorative phrase, and actually I'm not using it uh, against uh, freeloading postdocs. I'm not using it against postdocs because I think most freeloading postdocs are actually professors. Hashtag no pressure. So this system means that people who get themselves claw into multi-authored papers and lots of them reap the citation benefit from other people's work. But the ironies continue because collaborations are valued in our current system. And that's great. I love a good collaboration. But what that means is the sole researcher who doesn't have the research assistance and actually does their own work is then questioned for their inability to play with others. So as you can see, this entire system is geared for academics to feed off the work of PhD students. Now, as a senior professor said to me only a couple of weeks ago, my PhD students are my workers. My PhD, my, my PhD students are my workers. So as you can see, this system is geared to be unjust and the citation metrics is geared to reward the freeloading postdocs getting themselves under lots and lots of papers even if those freeloading postdocs are professors. Now yes, through the last five and a half years as this vlog series has continued, we've had fantastic new research codes of conduct and that is amazing. And we also are now seeing a lot of journals asking all the authors to sign off the percentage of their contribution. Both of those initiatives are incredibly welcome. But none of this is actually changing how the citations are measured. All we can do as humans, as scholars, is to be ethical and work hard. And know that every single one of us has war wounds where somebody in one of our articles at least did absolutely nothing, nothing and added themselves to that article. In my case, it was a PVC who added himself to a paper as the first author, didn't write one word of it, didn't read it, and I was a full professor at the time. So when this freeloading postdoc behavior starts to be aggressively patrolled through research conduct and our PhD students start to have their ideas protected, then this research culture will change. Eight, know that academics are rarely trained teachers and have to be dragged to any supervisory training. Now, after authorship, the second most frequent complaint I receive is about the quality of supervision. Now, as I've stressed, it is your thesis. You are responsible for creating that portfolio of support around you. But remember, most academics have absolutely no teaching qualification or educational qualification of any kind. And they have to be dragged, dragged to supervisory training. It has to be mandatory and they have to be threatened from being removed from supervision to force them to attend any training. So this means that supervisors continue to supervise as they were supervised, or indeed, even more worrying, they supervise how they think they were supervised. Now you can see the problem here. In the last five years, certainly the last 10, but while we've been conducting this vlog series, a whole series of changes have happened in our research culture. Firstly, a much more robust discussion about sexual harassment, sexual assault, and the importance of separating out personal and professional lives. Also clear guidelines for authorship, 
through the research code of conduct. We've got a sharpening of ethical guidelines, particularly with regard to uh, work with Indigenous colleagues and Indigenous communities. Co-design is much more important here, so research ethics with Indigenous and First Nations people, that's a big and emerging area. And also the increasing diversity of people in our doctoral programs. So you can see what's going wrong here. If a supervisor through their career has almost only supervised young men on scholarship, then they simply do not have the andragogical ability or the multimodal ability to know how to engage with diverse groups and cultures. So I remember uh, recently a, a supervisor called me a series of relatively provocative names <laughs> at a public meeting, he was very, very angry uh, that he was being asked to do supervisory training because he's fabulous. And because I'm not fabulous, he used a lot of language about how I'm not fabulous. And it was up to me in this public meeting to quietly explain to him that the majority of our students are women and our students start at Flinders University at 40 years of age. So at that point, he got a bit quiet, and I know why because all of his students had been these young men straight out of an honours program and on scholarship. So that meant he could supervise them as he had been supervising in the past. But as honours numbers are dropping, and they are dropping, and as public funding for education and scholarships decline, that past of a PhD program is not our future. Therefore, when you are thinking about a supervisor, when you're thinking about selecting a co-supervisor or an associate supervisor, ask them about their attitudes about professional development for you, but also for themselves and check out their profile. It's very, very important that outstanding researchers supervise you. That's not even in question. But just because somebody is an outstanding researcher, does not mean that they can teach you how to be an outstanding researcher because teaching and supervision are skills in form, not content. And unless supervisors are a master in form, then they can't actually convey or communicate their content. Nine, focus on your present. You've heard me say so often, focus on your present. The best PhD students I always say, give me a good day. They just give me one good day. And then they get up the next morning and they give me another good day. The past is gone, let it go. So give me a good day today. Get up early, give me an hour of power and work today when you don't feel like it. In, in fact, particularly on a day you don't feel like working, work hard. And that is what creates a successful PhD. 10. Be realistic about the future. Dear friends, dear friends, we are in for a tough few years. As this pandemic ends, we are entering an interregnum. An interregnum is an in-between time when universities are going to have to work out what they are. What's the point? What do they do? This is also, this interregnum is also the context for what Jean Baudrillard described as the double refusal. This is important, the double refusal. This phrase refers to the refusal to lead, but also the refusal to be led. What that means is the leadership in so many universities around the world showed themselves to be lacking through the pandemic. And because the leadership has been so poor in our universities around the world, the results have been catastrophic to higher education. The leaders didn't lead, and then the followers, recognising the complete incompetence of the leaders, stopped listening to the leadership. Now, the result of this double refusal was and is chaos, restructures, and even more worrying than restructures is a complete loss of faith or understanding in what a university is and what a university can be. Now, this state will not last forever. It's an interregnum. But you have some choices to make. 
You can give up on our universities or you can rise to the challenge. Work hard on your research, commit deeply to professional development and give yourself the task to learn something new every single day. Learn how to teach, please. Learn how to supervise, please. Read research codes of conduct. Make a pledge to yourself and others that you, you will not be that freeloading postdoc on other people's papers, that you will care and support and nurture the research of others. And most importantly, be kind. Don't bully, don't ridicule, don't confuse, don't frighten. And that includes disrespecting your supervisor because you never know what another human is experiencing. For example, let's think about us, what we've shared in the last five and a half years. In the last five and a half years that we have shared, uh, my husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I was the only carer for him. We were alone in the city. We'd come to do this job. There was no family, no friend support, and I was in full-time work on a contract. And I was caring for a man that was my whole world. And then he died and I was alone. And when the person you love most in the world dies, most of you dies with them. So I had to work out how much of me is left. And so I made a decision, look, let's just get up the next day and work a good day. Keep supervising these wonderful students, keep writing. And during these five and a half years, I've supervised 51 students to completion, produced 52 articles and book chapters, and yes, three books. And of course, I was also then able to share my life again <laughs> with an astonishing human. So during these five and a half years, we've all then shared my remarriage at this impossibly old age. And uh, one of my students, the legendary Mick Winter, died. Mick, thinking of your brother. And my other students had profound sicknesses, miscarriage, confronted racism and homophobia of an incredible degree. Now, that was my five years of my, my life, bizarrely documented through this vlog series, which has sort of become this accidental autobiography uh, in weekly instalments. But this was a story that we shared in the last five years. Think about your story in the last five years. So before you trash somebody, before you abuse somebody, consider the heavy backpack of grief and loss and fear that that person may be carrying and come to this moment with care and with decency. Deep listening is so much more important than talking and self-reflection is so much more important than ridiculing others. Create strong relationships with your supervisor, with your co-supervisors, with your colleagues and peers in the lab and in the department. Because in the end, in the end, these stories are all we have. I thank you all for sharing your stories with me. I hold them in my hands as I hold all of you in my thoughts and in my memory. So at vlog 300, we conclude this series. I'll see you down the road. Yes, there will be another video series on my YouTube channel delivered from a very different place. But I thank you for the early mornings and the long nights that we've shared in the last five and a half years. Your stories matter because you matter. I wish you love, light and peace. For the last time, T.L. Cheers.